Welcome everyone to another Schoolscape Online webinar. The purpose of these webinars is to help you as a school go online. And I believe today's topic that we're going to be talking about is super, super relevant. So we're going to be talking about the sensible use and inter integration of technology into learning and the teaching process. And it's super relevant at the moment. In studio with me is uh, Rian van der Berg from Fedsys. Rian, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be with you guys. Brilliant. Uh, Rian, I know you will do a better description of your position than I will. So maybe if you can just, um, before we dive into the questions, just explain uh, who you are. Well, number one, uh, I'm Rian van der Berg. I'm with FETSAS. So I'll say something about FETSAS first. It's the School Governing Body Association, uh, the Federation of School Governing Bodies of South African Schools. It's a very long name for an even longer acronym. Uh, but yeah, we, we exist to, to support schools and school governing bodies in the delivery of quality education and the governance process around that. My role in FETSAS is that of the manager of the Center for Technology. A few years ago, we, we headed up uh, or started an initiative to, to take schools by the hand and support them, guide them and advise them on the use of 21st century tools. We, we kind of wish to not use the word technology that much because uh, paper and chalkboard was also technology when it came out. It's, it's actually just being relevant in the time that we are. And that's my role in FETSAS. Brilliant. Rian, thank you. To all of our live viewers, it's fantastic to have you online. On the right of your screen, you will see a chat section. Um, there is also a questions tab. If you have any questions for Rian as we go, please drop them in there. We are going to chat for about 20 minutes and then make 10 minutes available at the end just to dive into any questions. So welcome everybody. Rian, let's um, get in, and I think this is pretty much to me one of the most important questions to start with, and it's quite a heavy hitter. Will technology replace teachers? Yeah, I think there's a big fear, and even before COVID-19, whenever I was at a conference and technology gets some airtime, uh, out of the teacher corps, core, there's a, there's a fear that technology will replace them. And my quick answer to that is, will a gun replace a police officer? Uh, and I don't think so. So technology will definitely enable the, the learning and teaching process. It will add onto it. It will enhance it. But we don't see a teacher uh, in a different form or a different role, maybe, ever being replaced by technology. We don't see anything uh, replacing a peep, a, a the, the role of a person uh, as such, but it's the effective use and the sensible use of it that gets um, you know, more, more focused now. So I don't think there's a fear in that, definitely not in the short term uh, and, and in my mind, not in the long term either. The, the um, caveat to that is teachers that use technology will definitely replace teachers that do not use technology because that's the world that we're living in. Okay. Uh, and I think that's quite a big point and tying in with that, maybe a follow up question. Will online school ever replace school? In, in some cases it has. I think there's online universities and that kind of thing. But I think school has a social construct that parents want to send their kids to. And there's a social element. There's a um, sense of belonging element. Um, so, so, so I don't see school being replaced by uh, online school, but I don't also, in the same you know, breath, think that school is a place. School is a process. School is, is not where you go, but it's what you do. Um, and school, you school with others, you school by yourself, you school with a book, you school with a teacher, you school in front of a computer. So, so it's your education process that needs to, to, it's more of a paradigm shift to see that school is not a building, but school is a process. And uh, in the past, school has taken place at home and at school, if that's a place, at, at the premises. But I think in future, um, there's going to be a more of a blend in that uh, school will be taken mobile, taken unlocalized, unscheduled. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's going to be a bigger blend of it, but I don't see online school replacing school. But I think we need to rewire our minds to think that school is not a place, but it's a process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big point. You, you also made the point that the teachers are going to need to use technology. So all of that factors in that, um, with that. But one of the things that's often not addressed, and I, I just want to dive into this for a little bit. When we're looking at sensible use and integration of technology, one of the things that we don't often discuss is cybersecurity and then also the other people issues, just how screen time, 
depressions. So maybe if we can start on the latter, um, if you can just talk to us about those kind of people issues that come with technology and what's reasonable to do around that. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a topic that we can spend a whole webinar on. But uh, if, if, if we can talk about the people issues, I think these are critical. And, and uh, in many situations where we've been talking to schools, the fear of the overindulging in screen time, um, you know, is, is so big that people say, let's, let's deny our learners the use of these technologies because of the fear. And I think that's like saying we're never going to go into a car in South Africa because more people die on the roads in South Africa than any other country, but we still drive. We've got to balance our fear and our use of it and then, and then manage it. So, so screen time um, is as uh, dangerous. You know, six hours in front of anything is dangerous. Uh, so the studies that are out in America and the effects that it have, but if you do six hours of rugby or chess in one day, that's also not healthy. So I think we've, we've got to get some common sense and sensibility into the process by saying, let's manage it. And it's a people issue. So um, let's, let's get good values. Uh, fits us as a strong value-driven um, thinking process and, and values in schools are important, but values at home is, is also important. So, so if I say use technology, I'm not saying go from zero in or 100% interactivity with people to zero interactivity. Use it for a, an hour at a time or 40 minutes at a time and use that for your kids to self-regulate themselves, to say, okay, well, I'm going to set the rules. Uh, I, I, did, I signed a contract with my own son. He, he loves Minecraft. He loves the screen. So I told him at the beginning of the holidays uh, in December, you write the contract and you sign it and I will make sure that you stick to your plan. I didn't tell him how many hours. And he came up with 40 minutes in the morning, 40 minutes in the afternoon. And then I just guide him through that. But then he takes responsibility for his own actions. And he was nine at the time, or eight at the time. So, so I think we've got to be aware of the risks, um, but we've got to introduce the people process next to it. Uh, but... Um, yeah, disconnection definitely happens. But in this time, we are very connected now, uh, you and I, yeah. although we are far apart. So we've got to think of connection and disconnection differently. So is it social distancing or is it socializing on a distance? Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we can socialize with distance between us and it's a people activity. So yeah, I think we, we need to unpack that more, but we've got to be aware of it. Don't just dump kids in front of screens, give them a lot of work or a lot of play and think they're going to regulate themselves. We as the Adults, the teachers, and the parents have got to guide them through this difficult turmoil seas. Okay. Uh, maybe, Ryan, and uh, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, can you give me a practical, say a teacher is now watching, and they are, they've taken their school online and they're actually issuing tasks. What, what is realistic and reasonable with a student on the other side? So, and I think, uh, what is realistic time that they should be behind screen and also and I think what ties in with this not only is there that factor but there's also a parent that is trying to do their day job especially in the lower grades mm. I'm, I'm talking primary pre-primary that needs to do their work as well what is realistic with mm. regards to to time behind the screen yeah I think the, the, there's a few issues in the in that uh, very loaded question there the number one thing is is the school needs to have a solid plan of what they want to do. Um, at the start of the COVID-19 time or the lockdown time, we produced a, a brainstorming strategic planning document. It's not a strategic plan, but it's a brainstorming that the school, the teachers, the HGB should sit down and say, what are the guidelines that we're going to follow? Because we've got to think about this. I think uh, in the lower grades, the, the, the impact that we want to have on the children might want to be an hour or two a day with maybe um, a mix of a 20 minute or 15 minute session and then some practical work that they can do. But keep in mind that the teacher is still the teacher and the parent suddenly does not become the teacher and the parent has work in many cases themselves. So we've got to, we've got to balance it as the school and, and the teacher. So don't just send a ton of work and it keeps the kids busy for six hours, but it's guided work and the, and the learner then needs the parent to do that. So, so we've got to balance it out. Um, I think uh, three hours max for grade seven, two hours max for grade six through four going down and in the foundation phase, 
an hour, hour and a half, uh, you know, to keep them busy, but with some screen time and some paper time and some creative time. Give them a task to go cut out a lot of pictures for a, for a collage that they need to make, but get the balance right. But don't overburden. There's, there's a business case model that schools need to get right now. A lot of schools are delivering online, number one, to keep uh, learning and, and, and teaching going. Number two, to protect the business model, because if they do not present lessons, then there's less of a, an urgency from the parents to pay. So there's, it's a mix of that. But don't overburden the parent that the parent suddenly says, oh, but the, parent, the, the, the teacher is just sending me a stack of work and I'm now becoming the teacher. What do I pay for now? So there's a tipping point where, you, where you're over-exaggerating um, sending work yeah. home. So, so it's, it's very difficult. Reasonable, those, those are my guidelines. One hour, two hours, three hours. Wow. That's brilliant. Uh, Rian, just uh, you, you mentioned uh, school business model and um, Megan posed the following question. Parents don't seem to think that online learning, especially now during lockdown, is worth the fees that they are paying. How do we combat that? I don't know if you have an answer or some thoughts. Yeah, I think it's really critical. Um, the, the, there's two business models for schools. Uh, the, the one is the independent school model, which is a contractual uh, relationship between the parent and the um, school. The second one is the public school model, which is a statutory payment if the school fees were uh, decided upon at a school AGM. So if, if in the public school arena, the parents are obliged to pay, but uh, the school has got to come to the party and say, but what product are we still giving in this time? Uh, there might be some catch up time later. So you'll get the value for your money for the yearly fee that you're going to be paying. In, in this time, we've got to protect the business model in a sense that, it, that, that we get the balance right, that we actually do learning and teaching and not necessarily sticking to the full lesson plan of, of the year, but we've got to show value. And the value has got to be in it that the, the teachers are still engaged. A lot of schools are making the mistake of just sending parents to outside content, outside platforms. But parents pay for that school, for that teacher, for that grade, and they want the local connection. That's what I find. Um, you know, I can go to, to Khan Academy and get all the math that I want for my kids, but I want my teacher that has the relationship. So there's a physical and relational space that the school can manage more than just the delivery. And I think that's easy. That's the easy ins and the easy outs for school to do. I don't know if I'll answer the question, but yeah. Um, no, we've, we've, that's we've, that's we've, uh, I think it's very relevant to mm. schools. Uh, we're going to get back onto technology now. Just one of the things that you mentioned. Yeah, uh, hundreds. One of my kids' teachers, on every Tuesday, she breaks up a day into 15-minute slots, and she has three kids at a time come on, and she just chats to them. How are you doing? How are you feeling? So it stays away from work and more on the relationship side. And I was quite amazed. I was like, wow, I get that connection. Yeah. Uh, Rian, let's jump back into uh, sensible, reasonable use of integration. Can technology save the day? We're in lockdown. We don't know when schools are going to go back. Can technology save the day? Yes, I think the enabling power of the technology can save the day. We are using a webinar platform now, but buying a license for this platform doesn't make the webinar happen. We've got to talk to each other and we've got to arrange it. So there's a people, uh, a people process using the technology. So yeah, I think technology can definitely be a big ingredient to, to the recipe of the success of, of saving the day. But um, yeah, some, of the, some of the myths we might want to touch on now is, is yeah. that technology will suddenly, will suddenly just fix it. We just buy a license for something and, and the computer does it. It's, it's like saying pastel replaced accountants. No, it did not. It just enabled more efficient accounting, more high uh, volume processing, more high level reporting and more detailed reporting. So, so we've got to, got to position it that it's not technology and, and it's going to happen by itself. It's not a button that you press and see school happens. It's, it's the use of it in the hands of the right people. And back to our first question, um, will, will technology replace teachers? No. Technology in the hand of the right teacher will replace the way we used to do it and will change to a new normal of how we're going to do it. That's brilliant. Um, are there any other myths out there that you think are, are relevant at the moment when it comes to technology? Yeah, I think uh, one of the big issues, and we are very overwhelmed in this, uh, this, in this time, there are so many solutions out there. So, so, so the first thing is, which I mentioned, that 
the product will save the day. The product will do what I need to do. The pro buy the product and it will work. I think that's a myth. The second one is the best product. Maybe can I put in, in inverted commas, the best salesman <laughs> uh, yes. will be best for me. So, so if you have a plan and you know what you want to do, you find a product that fits into your vision as a teacher or as a school or as school management, which means that it's not necessarily the best product, meaning all the lines of code and all the bells and whistles, but maybe the simplicity of it that works best for you. There's a saying in, in software that it's not the best software that's best, it's the software that you know best that is best. So the one that you actually use, the one that you can drive into, you know, through all the gears into fourth gear, then you get get the value out of it. But but it's not just the best product because, I mean, it's like saying, you know, everyone should buy a Toyota because I drive a Toyota, but Ford and VW double cabs are just as well uh, performing in, in the market now. So it's, it's not just one product, it's the principles that the product gives uh, and, and the use of it that, that makes the difference. Um, okay. Another 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 myth might be might be the fact that we can't change because our staff. Do you know our staff? <laughs> our teachers are old school, <laughs> and I, and I think that's a myth that we've got to get by. Uh, we've got to uh, apply leadership and say, guys, the ship is sailing. We've got to get on. Um, we can't do anything now. Old school. Uh, so 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 let's break some of the myths and the holy cows in our in our staff room. I think that's great. Um, Ruin, we've had quite a few questions coming through because we, we're talking technology and I actually think it's relevant to ask now and uh, it's a straight, we've had two questions on it. Uh, how do we help those parents who don't have the technology or the data needed for work that you want to send them? Okay, I've, I've got two plans for that. Number one, uh, there is definitely a lot of resources on the zero rated sites. The problem with that is how to map that that is on zero rated sites to the work that we're doing. So someone's got to do the heavy lifting work and go find relevant stuff in the zero rated uh, arena and map it to your lesson plan, which is difficult. And that's the teacher's job. Um, the parent is not going to do that. That's like saying, you know, we've got an SABC and all the programs are there and, and just hope they turn it on when the news is on. You've got to map it to where it is. So data can be, it is probably the biggest talking point now. But there's a lot of material. You might not want to think the material is great, but it's at least something. But you've got to map it to get the value to it. The second one is, I've heard schools do this. Um, they, instead of sending food parcels to homes, they've sent data parcels to homes. And, and getting, you know, if there's a wow. 10 or 15% in the class that, that, that can't continue, um, let's make a donation and send three gigs or five gigs of data to that family and say, please stay connected, but use it for the education purposes. A lot of schools are doing that sort of, not a lot, but some schools we've heard are doing that. One school that I know of in, in Bloemfontein sent 75 households data for a month. And if you use light enough solutions, data light solutions, those parents and those kids can, can participate. Access to devices is a different thing. Um, and, and I'm not sure what the, the reach and the depth of cell phones um, in all contexts are, but according to a, a recent study by Deloitte, 95% of the country have access to a cell phone, not necessarily their own, but they've got access to it. So if you plan your day, not a six hour day, so it's not data heavy, but a WhatsApp, a D6 um, uh, communicator link to something, uh, a link to a zero rated site to say, but there's the material, you're not falling behind, you can see that. So there are plans to be made uh, in that, but yeah, very much contextual and I'm happy to speak to, to any individual school around this possibility. Awesome. Thank you. Rian, I know we're jumping yeah. around, so we, we talked about use of technology, we've spoken about um, will technology replace teachers, will technology save the day? Uh, we've spoken about some of the people issues, some of the cost issues. Um, if we can get quite practical now, where does the school start? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think the, the, the best thing is to be, the school has to plan something. Um, I'm going to try and share a slide if, and, and just yeah. say, um, this is what I, I thought about. Um, let's just have technology work for us. Uh, and. Can you see my screen? Is that good? Yeah, it's coming up now. So, so I'm not even going to put it on full screen. So start with what you have and with what you do. 
Um, if you don't know what you're doing now and what you're having, so if you are already using um, in-class technology, don't go and create something new. If you're using a PowerPoint, um, use that PowerPoint and just record your voice over it. Um, and then send that video file or a link to a storage place for that video file. And it's easy. Just Google, how do I save voice? It's just record slideshow. But how do I uh, save a voice note over the slideshow? Um, you can use your cell phone like a lot of people are doing now with sending funnies around. We see all the people running in their homes on the floor, uh, doing uh, cycling on suspended bicycles and whatever. So we're very creative when it comes to comedy. But we can use that same device to just, you know, uh, your, your cell phone is effectively a visualizer. Just record it. Just position it in, in such a way that it records you writing on a page. And you make a five or ten minute, you know, page handwriting lesson while you're talking. And there's a video file. Um, so start with what you have and what you already do. Don't create new culture now. Um, your plan, the school's plan is key. So you've got to have a plan to not just say, well, we just got to answer to everyone else and do what the school next door does. Be very intentional. I think simplicity is key. And Leonardo da Vinci is, is far smarter than I am. And he said simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So keep it as simple as possible. Unscramble the egg completely. And, and the overwhelming solutions that we find now uh, sound very complex to a lot of people. Um, you know, we, we, we've got so many solutions that can do everything for everyone, but it ends up doing nothing for no one if you don't use it well. So use one tool in one platform and just work that hard. Um, but that creates the culture of moving on to the second and third and fourth gear of, of that. I think your teachers are key and be very intentional. I think the role of the teacher is not just delivering material, uh, but also being relational. And you alluded to that earlier with your own kids. And then think Think differently about data. Uh, you spoke about it earlier, but get connected. Um, a lot of people are saving traveling money now on petrol. Why not use that to be the, <laughs> the injection to get you to work? Data is now getting you to work. Work is just not a place. It's an activity. And data is, is the fuel that puts you on the highway. Um, so, so I think, yeah, don't let data be the problem. Um, and, and, and make sure that you get connected. So those are just four or five bullets that I thought of, of how to start um, on this journey. Yeah, I think that's great. I also think a lot of schools are starting at the moment. And I think it's a lot of trial and error. And I think there we, we've done some previous webinars with uh, speakers from some of the biggest ed tech companies who are just even saying, you're not going to get it right. Slowly but surely, you will work it out. Yeah. So and I think that's good. Rather win in a couple of things um, and start building. And you can always add new products or services, but win in those first ones. So I think that's a very, very valid point. Very much so. Pete, so just on, on the last thing about the data, I see there's a few questions in the chat box about yes. error rated. So on, on the FEDSOS website and on many websites, but uh, the, the GDE, not the GDE, the DBE, uh, education.gov.za has a host of the zero rated sites uh, listed. Vodacom's, uh, Vodacom eSchool is zero listed. Oh, I want to sneeze now. So um, if you go to the FEDSAS website, fedsas.org.za, there's an open area called COVID-19 resources. It's a little button right at the top. If you open that up, there's a Google Drive space. Uh, but even in that space, there, there, there are two documents. It's a resource document and there's a strategic planning document. So you can put those links in, in for the people if you want, Pete. But it's open documents. And there's a whole page on zero-rated sections or zero-rated sites out there. So there's a lot of zero-rated material. Apart from radio and TV, there's actual sites that can work, and it's true zero rate. It doesn't it doesn't bill you. Uh, but if you want, I can uh, share that quickly at the end of the. If we have time, I can share yes. it on the website. No. Uh, no, as well. Um, Rian, one of the questions that has come up a, a couple of times as well, and it's something that we haven't chatted about when it comes to a school and where do they start? Cybersecurity. Um, it is a people issue, so we got a question now coming in. From a legal point, how compliant are schools and SGBs with the Poppy Act if there is a data breach and student data gets compromised during the lockdown? Am I, as a teacher, liable? And I think it is a fantastic question. Yes, um, yeah, um, over to you, Pete. 
<laughs> no, it's, it's a great question. Number one, Poppy is not uh, fully operational, but data security is everyone's concern. So, so the Poppy Act is, is in dry run. Uh, there were talks that it was going to be live on the 1st of April. But I think as responsible leaders in schools, we need to, to protect the data of our people. So there are two things. It's the, number one, uh, protecting ourselves from the hack. And um, if you just see the, the, uh, the spike in cyber attacks over the last few weeks, uh, that's where the, everyone knows that we're online most of the time. So, so you've got to think of cybersecurity and then sharing data online. Now, depending on what platform you use, uh, you, you have to be in a secure environment. So that's why we like the Google space, the Microsoft Teams space, um, uh, where, where you host your regular data, your school administration system, um, D6+, uh, uh, EduPack, those kind of things. Make sure that your data is secure where it is stored. When you go online now, people should know and, and teach your people well that they don't just put in usernames and passwords everywhere and sign up for every, everything free. So I think digital literacy needs also, citizenship and literacy needs to be taught in this time to say, be very aware of the risks of that. And then there's a lot of things, um, even on our site, the, the resource document that I referred to earlier has some, some tips on cybersecurity at home, how to secure your, your Wi-Fi router, your fiber router at home, how to ensure that no porn uh, gets watched on that. So there's a little video on, on porn proofing your house and, and make sure that your kids don't unnecessarily click on the wrong things. And then teachers need to, to be sure that they don't share learners information with other teachers outside of school on their platforms and the school should not necessarily share teachers um, personal details now you know send out a whatsapp to the whole school and say you can contact the math teacher on this number that is a breach of security so we've got to be cognizant of that liability um, of the school's data lies with the accountable officer at the school for the data so the, okay. the school needs to appoint an accountable data officer per the poppy act Wow, so the school actually needs to appoint someone. Yeah. Maybe just break that down because I think that's very relevant and I'm not sure how many schools would have done that. Yeah. And is that relevant now already? I think that was relevant. Uh, we've, we've been talking about that in, in the governance space uh, through FEDSOS for a while now, just understanding the draft of the Poppy Act. Um, and it, it probably speaks to, to something else that I wanted to highlight today is that we've got to think differently of the environment that we're in. For the last year or so, we've been saying in the FEDSOS space, schools should start thinking of appointing appointing, electing, or, or having someone in the SGB that fulfills the role of the CIO. So we have the CEO, we have the CFO, we have the COO, we have oh, so many chief officers. I think there's about 20 of them listed in, in uh, Forbes magazine. But the CIO is someone that's called the chief information officer. So that's someone that carries the responsibility of thinking about the school's data, the information, and the role that they can play in securing that and understanding the legal aspect of it as well. So the Poppy Act, um, GDPR, the European uh, standards and that, that sort of thing. So the schools need to have someone that look into the Poppy Act or, or do a Poppy course on the FETSAS online. Um, we've got a FETSAS eLearn platform. There's an introductory course on Poppy, which is free up until the end of COVID. So you can jump in and do a, an introductory Poppy course uh, today, self-guided, computer-based, uh, self-paced, uh, training course on introduction of understanding poppy which i think is very important now but don't not do technology because we're scared of the risks understand the scientific approach of what your risks are and manage them um you know so so, so get the detail and someone at the school is responsible you, you you've got to appoint someone at the school brilliant Ryan, we we're nearly having to come to an end we've literally got a yeah. minute or two left i'd like to pose one last question that's come in and they give you an opportunity just on a a closing comment from your side. Uh, Kevin asked a great question, and I think this is very much in line with reasonable use of technology in a school. It says, he says, what is suggested, a suggested way to manage technical support for parents remotely, especially those parents that are not computer literate? So how do you handle the parents out there that might not be tech savvy? Yeah, I think uh, uh, in other slideshows or presentations that I've done this week, that's one of the number one challenges that we listed is tech support uh, internally for the staff and then for parents. So, so where we start with the thinking, and it's in our document, is to do an in-depth survey 
of understanding the abilities of your audience. It doesn't help that you use a very complex solution um, to deliver a great product to save your business model, but at the end of the day, no one can use it because you're over, in a, in a, in a nice way, over their heads now. So, so you've got to be um, understanding of where you're, so what do you have and what do you do? Um, as the starting point is, what do we have as digitally literate parents or households? And should we have a blended feel in the same class? And I think that's where we are now. I think we're going to blend more than tech and paper. We're going to blend home and school. We're going to blend uh, on the access level, people that have and people that have not. On the data level, people that have and people that have not. On the grade level, <laughs> grades that are included and grades that are not. On the subject level, more important subjects and less important subjects. So we're going to blend multidimensionally. But to, to tech support a thousand parents, is impossible to do. So you've got to revisit based on the statistics and, and, and scientific approach on your survey to know that your plan reaches the intended solution and not just send out high tech stuff. So, so yeah, there's, there's a little bit of a, a difficulty in that, but I think we're running out of time and I would like to yeah. discuss that with Kevin, if it was Kevin. <laughs> yeah, it was. Mm. Um, uh, Ren, maybe if you could just give us a closing comment just around something that will be a handle for schools when it comes to reasonable use of technology and effective use of technology. Yeah, I think the, the, the key is not that technology is available. So, so the two descriptive words that we've used, the um, sensible use, so it must be sensible to use it. Sometimes automation is not sensible. My wife chops you know, carrots quicker than I can build a machine to chop 100 carrots because you just start and you do something. So it's got to be sensible. Uh, and then integration. It mustn't be loose of our regular life and regular process. So, so integrate it in a way that it makes sense and use it in a way that makes sense. And then technology has value. And let's demyth or uh, not mystify technology. It is just a tool. Where do you live? We live in the 21st century. We don't live elsewhere. <laughs> and, and, and that's my thing. So, so go Google. Yeah. <laughs> The bad words out of every problem that you have. Type your, yeah. type your problem into Google and figure it out now because we've got to be creative uh, and, and, and find ourselves in a new space. And I'm hoping that the effect of COVID-19 in the online and, and blended learning space will be a lingering effect that will have longer term, more efficiency, better delivery of, of learning and teaching with better outcomes. Brilliant. Rian, thank you so much. I know we have jumped all over the place, but I think there's been some incredibly big points. For any of our viewers uh, out there, we have a webinar on cybersecurity that we did with Sonic Wall. I did place the link. Uh, you can also just search for it on our webinars page. Uh, thank you also to everyone who put through questions. Uh, I think from Schoolscape and Schoolscape Online, what we want to do is try and introduce you to companies that can help with that reasonable execution so if you are battling and need help from companies uh, that's where we play and we're very happy to help and support and that's why most of our webinars will will bring in a, a partner so thank you everyone we appreciate keep an eye out for more webinars Rian really appreciate you taking the time that was fantastic thank you so much thanks so much good day cheers